Like, if that collective uses every single dime generated from Patagonia directly back into, like, actively fighting for climate change, then yeah, that's good. That's an overall good thing, okay? But I don't think it's going to do that. <laughs> All right, let's talk about, uh, speaking of, you know, copyright infringement, let's watch friend of the show, Adam Conover's video as I react to it. Makes overpriced vests for tech bros who pretend to be outdoorsy. Got a metric fuckload of good headlines this month when their billionaire owner, Yvon Chouinard, announced that he was donating the entire company to fight climate change. Twitter exploded in jubilation. The Washington Post said, finally, a billionaire willing to smack back at capitalism. Even the beloved environmentalist Bill McKibben said, if every company was as decent as Patagonia, the world would work better and people would be cozy all winter. Now, this is a wonderful story. I would love to believe that there's a good billionaire out there looking out for the planet from atop his pile of money. But you can feel what's coming, can't you? I mean, I wouldn't be making this video if there weren't a darker truth to expose. Am I really gonna do this? Am I actually gonna disagree with Patagonia, the media, and Bill McKibben, a man I deeply respect and admire, and tell the world why this feel-good story is actually terrible? Yes. Fuck yeah, I am. Not only was this donation designed to help Chenard avoid billions of dollars in taxes, the fact that it's even possible for a billionaire to pull this maneuver is an unmitigated disaster for the planet and for our democracy. And when we swallow PR like this, we are literally falling for the oldest billionaire bullshit in the book. Now, a lot of people found this story believable, including me at first, because it fits Chenard's carefully cultivated public image. He's been described for years as the reluctant billionaire, a frugal rock climber who just loved making gear for his friends, then tripped and accidentally started a $3 billion company. People tell stories about Chenard eating cans of cat food to save money, and he famously still drives a Subaru instead of a fancy car. The dude supposedly doesn't even own a cell phone, which is maybe why he doesn't know that human food is just as cheap as cat food. You weren't saving money, Yvonne. You were just being weird. And as far as corporations go, Patagonia does have a solid environmental record. They've donated over $140 million to a huge number of organizations, promoting everything from land conservation to biodiversity to sustainable agriculture to the end of fossil fuels. Now, Chenard said that he wanted the company's commitment to the planet to continue after his death. So instead of selling the company to some corner-cutting capitalist who would start powering the fleeced vest factories with coal and, I don't know, cancel the Batgirl movie again, he decided to donate all of his stock to a nonprofit organization with a mission of helping the planet. In a New York Times piece so glowing it might as well have been written by his publicist, Chenard said that hopefully this donation will influence a new form of capitalism that doesn't end with a few rich people and a whole bunch of poor people. And his own accountant said that he'll receive no tax benefit for his donation whatsoever. But if you want the straight story about a billionaire's finances, it might make sense to ask someone other than the guy who cooks the books for him. The truth is, if Chenard really just wanted to make sure that Patagonia's value value stayed intact, he didn't need to donate it to a nonprofit. He could have just given all $3 billion worth of shares to his kids. They could have kept running the company according to Daddy Dearest's wishes and lovingly rapped about him at corporate board meetings. So why didn't he do that? Simple. He would have had to pay $1.2 billion in gift taxes. And Yvonne's a good billionaire, so he doesn't like paying taxes. I mean, why should he have to pay for the roads his products are transported on, the schools and universities his workers are educated at, the GPS system that he uses to track his shipments, and the government research into heart attacks and cancer that have kept him alive and- Ultimately, my take on this uh, when it first came out was that it's all entirely dependent on how the funds get used. And I'm not in the business of assuming that the dude is going to fucking absolutely use this as his personal uh, slush fund and uh, use this as a way to like avoid taxes and then, you know, uh, do his personal slush fund tax free. I don't think that billionaires are good. Obviously, there's no such thing. Um, and the adequate and good thing would be to turn your company into a more democratic Turn your company into a more democratically uh, operated uh, structure. Twitter lefties are going to love this one, Law. I mean, it's true, though. He's not wrong. But like I said, it could be... Look, two things can be true. One, with when it's billionaires we're talking about, it's a race to the fucking bottom, okay? 
So this dude is doing something that is otherwise good, but he's still utilizing the same uh, the, the the same mechanisms that are afforded, the same financial tools that are afforded to the mega wealthy to avoid paying taxes. If he uses this specifically like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation or something like that, then it's fucked up. If, it, if he uses like Mark Zuckerberg does to just make better PR, to get better PR for himself, then that's kind of fucked up. Of course, those other companies still have regular for-profit operations going on, and they're only simply... Uh, taking the the you know Bill Gates portion and dumping it into the Bill Gates 501c4 I believe or is it a 501c3 same with Mark Zuckerberg like a lot of a lot of billionaires do this shit where they're just like hey man and Bill Gates was like the first one who did it um hey we're just gonna I, I don't care about money anymore like look at me I'm doing so much charitable giving the only difference though is that this fucking guy is a bit of a freak from the jump like, he was always kind of like a weirdo, I just want to fucking climb rocks, I don't give a shit type dude. You know what I mean? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, whereas I am immediately going to be not as charitable because they are fucking billionaires, and uh, that means that, like, you have generated this profound amount of wealth by still exploiting uh, your wage laborers, okay? Okay. But for him, it seems like it goes far beyond aesthetics. He's just like a straight up, yeah, as, as someone in the chat just said, straight up dirtbag climber. You know what I mean? So ultimately, he was all, yeah, he was always just a, I want to climb rocks type dude, bro. He was always just a, I want to climb rock types dude, bro. You know, that's just PR. Oh, you were making fun of me. No, I, I, I don't think so. I don't think that's just PR. No, I think he is like that. But my favorite part of the story is the fact that this is yet another instance of a fundamental breakdown in capitalism. We should not be reliant on the magnanimous nature of billionaires. How many times do I have to fucking say this? That is inherently undemocratic just because one guy decided to be a dirtbag rock climber who happened to... Uh, happened to be exploitative enough to make a billion, but also, uh, you know, simultaneously nice enough to fucking uh, try to revert those funds back into the fucking environment does not fundamentally fix the system. We cannot expect people out of the kindness of their own fucking hearts to get to this position of power and then turn around and be like, you know what? I'm done. I'm going to do good things. Okay? That's the reason why the system is not working. Because if philanthropy worked, there would be no need for philanthropy. <laughs> If the system worked, there would be no need for a philanthropy. There just wouldn't. But the system is so fundamentally flawed that philanthropy is seen as a way to like plug some of the holes, which it doesn't, which it never does, because those philanthropic organizations also operate like a capitalist organization with their CEOs making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with a lot of the funds being reverted back in the marketing and not necessarily actual, you know, uh, boots on the ground help. That's the issue. Fucking sucks. Uh, the only good billionaire is me. Because, you know, I'm a, I'm a billionaire. Until the ripe old age of 83. I mean, he's self-made, right? He did it all by himself. Now, I know what you're thinking. Adam, he didn't pay taxes because he did something better. He donated it to charity. Well... Let's take a look at how charitable that donation actually was. 98% of the shares Shinar donated were given to a brand new environmental nonprofit he formed called the Holdfast Collective. Like, if that collective uses every single fucking dime generated from Patagonia directly back into, like, actively fighting for climate change, which is highly unlikely, but if they are supposed to do that, then yeah, that's good. That's an overall good thing, okay? Straight up, that is overall a good thing. But I don't think he's going to do that. But we'll see.
Kind of a weird name, sort of sounds like a mid-2000s Brooklyn indie band, but more about that in a second. The other 2% though, were Chenard's voting shares. These are the shares that let you actually control what the company does. And these shares were given to something called the Patagonia Purpose Trust, which is solely controlled by Chenard and his family. What this means is that even though all the headlines said Chenard was donating the company to charity, he and his family will continue to control Patagonia forever. You know, I didn't know that was how donations worked. When I donate my car to 1-800-CARS-FOR-KIDS, I can't show up the next weekend and take it for a joyride. But Yvonne and his family can. Now, the family did have to pay about $17 million in gift taxes to execute this maneuver. But don't forget, they already saved $1.2 billion by donating the other 98% to charity. So they came out roughly $1.2 billion ahead. That shit's not even a rounding error. So what about that other 98%? And who exactly is the Holdfast collected? Well. They're actually pretty mysterious. They don't even have a website. And when you Google them, you just find a bunch of Reddit threads of people asking, what the hell is the Holdfast Collective? But what we do know from the New York Times is that the Holdfast Collective will receive roughly $100 million a year in profit from Patagonia, and that they plan to use that money to influence the US political system. See, regular nonprofits are what's called 501c3s. 501c3s are required to use the money for charitable purposes and are barred from making political contributions. But the Holdfast Collective is a 501c4, and that means it's allowed to use that money to donate to politicians, super PACs, and even to conduct- Can you admit that the tax would just go into the military industrial complex? Brother, that's an anti-tax take. I don't know what community you, you're in, you think you're in, but that's insane. Yes, a chunk of it will go to the military industrial complex, but also a gigantic percentage of it will still go back to social security funds and and- uh, social services, rather, sorry, and and infrastructure. These are, these are, you know, incredibly important uh, uh, funds that that still need money. Another good video on the subject. Yeah, I'm not gonna watch Osama Salman Hajj again from 2019. We've watched it so many times. Conduct direct political campaigning. And since it's safe to assume that the Holdfast Collective is gonna be basically run by the Chenard family, considering they founded it and control its money supply, that means Yvonne was able to take his $3 billion company and turn it into a $3 billion political influence machine tax free. He didn't pay capital gains tax on the growth of the company. He didn't pay the income tax that I would have to pay before I donate to my favorite 501c4. And he definitely didn't pay the gift taxes you normally have to pay if you wanna give $3 billion in money and political influence to your kids. That's right, Patagonia made the jackets, but it was the rest of us who got fleeced. That's a Patagonia pun. Let's be clear. Because of their control of Patagonia and Holdfast, Chenard's descendants are going to wield massive political power for their entire lives. They're gonna be invited to meetings with powerful elected leaders. They'll be flown around the world to conferences. They'll be lauded as great philanthropists until the day they die when their kids will take over as money bags in chief. Chenard has turned his money into permanent political power for him and his descendants, and I do not think he should get a tax break for doing it. And look, I'll grant Chenard's good intentions here. I think that in addition to wanting to save money on his taxes, he and his family are motivated by a sincere desire to help the planet. And I think their donation, taken in isolation, will do that. But we can't take it in isolation, because Chenard is not the only billionaire pulling this move. And the other billionaires are a lot less cuddly than Mr. Puffer Vest for the planet. Let's talk about a different billionaire named Barry Side. The wonderful investigative journalism outfit ProPublica did an expose this year on Side when he pulled the exact same move as Yvonne, he donated his entire fortune to charity. But Twitter and the New York Times didn't throw a party in Barry's honor. Why? Because the charity he donated to was run by Leonard Leo, the right-wing activist yeah. who spent the last couple decades stacking the... This was fair. Like, this is fair. Uh, to, to make this comparison, even though, like, one part of it... To make the comparison when you talk about the underlying problem is fair. Obviously, the actions of this is infinitely worse than the overarching actions of the potential Patagonia Fund which will probably be for good because I am a pussy who cares about the environment, who believes that, uh, and also who believes that there is a difference between 
you know, good things and bad things like uh, caring about the environment and shifting our over-reliance on fossil fuel energy, the renewable resources, that's a good thing. Whereas like, uh, I don't know, killing fucking uh, women or jailing women for, for uh, getting an abortion is a bad thing. I know, I know, I'm sorry. It's kind of fucked up, but I do believe that. Uh, that that is a bad thing and uh, you know that's what the federalist society basically operates to do so hot take hot take man i know but functionally what he's doing is is uh, taking advantage of a similar structure possibly for good supreme court with radical conservatives you know the same conservatives who recently overturned roe v wade and banned the epa from regulating greenhouse gases cheering on chenard's abuse of the system just because you agree with his cause doesn't make sense it's like cheering for a baseball player who does steroids sure it's nice when he hits a home run for your team but when all the other teams are doing it too, you get your ass kicked and it kind of fucks the game up. It's also, how to put this, the opposite of democracy. See, everyone sees the world differently and everyone has different needs. And that means that no one person has all the answers. So the central insight of democracy is that we need to spread power widely and diversely among many different types of people if we want to solve our biggest problems. But billionaires like Chenard are doing the opposite. He's hoarding power, even if he feels that he's using it for good. But why should the owner of a fancy clothing company get to decide what's good or not? Why don't we all decide it? together. You know, maybe the billionaires could kick in their fair share to a communal pool of money we all contribute to, and then we could vote on what to spend it on. I don't know, just a crazy idea I found on this dusty old scroll. But no, instead, our system allows a few wealthy people to amass disgusting amounts of wealth and then gives them a tax break when they use it to influence our political system. And that is no way to run a society. Democracy only works when everybody has a voice. So instead of applauding Chenard, we do a lot better to take that power back for ourselves. Now, I think that argument is pretty straightforward. Open and shut, video could end right there. Except that when I posted about this on Twitter, I was deluged with hate from angry billionaire fans. And I started to realize that something deeper is going on here. I mean, people really love this cat food eating, Subaru driving, I mean, it's not even him. Like, I don't think he's a good example of like, uh, I mean, I guess maybe he's the best example for the reasons because like, uh, you know, he is someone that is uh, universally recognized as like a, like a good person, right? Rather than someone like Elon Musk, for example, who is recognized, hopefully, as a bad person by at least some. Elon didn't make graduation though. Okay, we're not even talking about Kanye, man. Holy shit. Humble billionaire who cares. I gotta and warm my chicken, boys. Hold you on. If you criticize him. I mean, he's got a great brand and people love it. I love it too. I love my Patagonia jacket. When I wear it, I feel like I'm in that Wes Anderson movie where Bill Murray is sad in the 60s. No, not that one, the other one. No, not that one, the other one. No, not that one, the other. That's the one, thank you. All right, there's three more though. But here's the problem. That story, that brand isn't real. It's PR, it's marketing, it's spin, baby. Let me tell you about a little place called Bentonville, Arkansas. So a few weeks back, I was booked to MC an event at Crystal Bridges Art Museum in Bentonville, a beautiful small town in northwestern Arkansas that also happens to be the home of one of the most lavish and expensive art museums in America. Why there? Well, a clue might be in the name you see emblazoned all over town, Walmart. Sam Walton opened the first Walmart store in Bentonville in 1962, and now that it's the largest retailer in the world, yes, larger than Amazon, its headquarters are still in Bentonville. Sam Walton is now dead, but his kids, the 11th, 12th, and 13th richest people in America, have poured money into the town. They've built miles of bike trails all around the surrounding area. They've preserved the beautiful, historic town square, and they've built a $200 million art museum. But that's not the only museum I visited in Bentonville that weekend. Housed in a replica of an old-fashioned five-and-dime store is the Walmart Museum, a monument to Sam Walton's humility and humble decency. They have Oh, this is so good. The absolute worst of the worst motherfucker. An exact replica of his shabby home office, which 
actually like brought a tear to my eye because it reminded me so strongly of my own grandfather's office when I was a kid. And according to this museum, Sam hated money so much that he drove a beat up old truck. And to prove it, they put the beat up old truck in the museum. Holy shit, swap the pickup for a Subaru and this could be the Patagonia Museum. Now there's something a little perverse in building an entire museum to tell people how humble and thrifty you are, but it works. People in this town love the Waltons. And when I struck up a conversation with them, they talked about the Waltons like they were family. Because of the Waltons investment, the population of Bentonville has sextupled. Property values have skyrocketed. Oh, and don't forget the- So no different to Bezos then? I mean, every billionaire does the same thing because it's effective PR. It's effective propaganda. That's why they do it. It's effective marketing. That's it. World-class art museum they built in town where Bentonville residents can chill out and look at a rock Sex. Co, listen to an artist of color, give a talk, or visit one of Yayoi Kasuma's famous infinity rooms. When I was waiting in line for this exhibit, I overheard two teenagers talking about how they had never- No, it's not the same way that gangs will provide food for the neighborhood. That's a means of survival. What are you talking about? No. Gangs provide food for the neighborhood because there is a secondary community component within gangs, especially when you're talking about underserved uh, uh, underserved neighborhoods. We're not talking about fucking doing PR. It's not even... One is, one is built around uh, uh, community development out of necessity and survival. The other is like literally someone who is like fucking... Uh, has his tentacles in every aspect of society and is doing it legally and... And, you know, is doing it specifically so that they can fucking, uh, so that they don't get uh, yelled at. I don't even, oh God, I just. I've never been to an art museum before. And oh, no. hearing that, you know, made my heart swell up. Like, this is a part of the country that has been left out of cultural investment for a century and the Waltons are changing that. That is unequivocally a good thing. But there's also a deep irony in Bentonville that makes visiting it almost creepy because even though the Waltons have preserved this perfect American small town, they only had the money to do so because they have destroyed the downtowns of so many other cities in America. According to a 2008 study from MIT, Walmart was responsible for 40 to 50% of the decline in small discount stores like the ones their museum was built to resemble. Other researchers found that when Walmart comes to town, it correlates with increased obesity, higher crime rates, and lower overall employment in that area. And this proves that the narrative Sam Walton spun about himself, that he never cared about money. He was just a humble guy who loved giving back. Well, it was bullshit. There are no accidental billionaires. The only way to make that kind of money is on purpose. This dude devoted his life to building the biggest, most profitable company he could, and then he used that money to tell a sweet and cuddly story about himself to distract from all the evil shit he did. And even though I don't think the average Patagonia wearer is a big fan of Walmart, it bears pointing out how closely the story Chouinard tells about himself resembles Walton's. The reluctant billionaire rock climber who doesn't care about money, drives a beat up old car, and loves giving back is a great story but it's also marketing. And Chouinard tells it because it benefits him and Patagonia to do so. I mean, how many made in Vietnam puffer vests have they sold over the years because somebody looked at them and said, hey, he's the good billionaire, I'm gonna help him save the planet. Hell, if you go to patagonia.com right now, they are using that story to sell you more overpriced crap. But look, none of this is new. The truth is that billionaires have been telling this story about themselves since the first proto-capitalist took his first quivering steps out of the money swamp. Let's do a quick review of the Billionaire Bullshit Hall of Fame. Mark Zuckerberg got incredible headlines when he said he was donating his fortune to charity in 2015. Then it turned out that charity was just an LLC he controls that invests in for-profit businesses. For years- Like, do you see what I mean? That is different, right? It's still different than like what the Patagonia thing is doing, but that is only if you want to believe that he's a good dude. Okay. Only if you believe that he's a benevolent person and that in and of itself is a, a silly childish way to operate. We should not expect benevolence from billionaires and we should not be relying on the benevolence of billionaires. Because even if one of them is, is genuinely a good person, it's still dumb as fuck.
Years, people have described Bill Gates as saving the world. He even made his own Netflix documentary about what a generous genius he is. Of course, that's before we learned he's a serial sexual harasser who became best buddies with Jeffrey Epstein after he was convicted of sex crimes. Bill True. was like, oh, this dude's a sex offender? Well, what's he doing Thursday? And finally, Warren Buffett, a man who decades of PR have described as so saintedly frugal that websites post listicles about how you can live as cheaply as him, with tips like eat a cheap breakfast. Yeah, I'm pretty sure if I ate Egg McMuffins all day, it wouldn't make me a billionaire. I'd just have a heart attack. I mean, this article literally says that Warren Buffett clips coupons. No, he fucking doesn't. Are you trying to tell me that Warren fucking Buffett gets up on a Tuesday, goes and gets the newspaper off his porch, takes out the advertising section and a pair of scissors and says, oh, look, Skippy is on sale? Fuck you, how gullible do you think we are? You know how Warren really saves money? By not paying his taxes. When also, if he's doing that, he's mentally ill. I'm sorry. That's not... Like him being a good, kind, frugal person, he's just severely and deeply mentally ill. ProPublica got a leak of billionaire tax returns. Buffett was found to pay the least of any of his fellow plutocrats. Dude made $24 billion between 2014 and 2018 and paid a true tax rate of 0.1%. Even greedy little piggies like Bezos and Musk can't touch that. Instead of paying the public the money he owes us, Buffett has famously pledged to give away his money to charity. Which charity, you might ask? Oh, just the one his buddy Bill runs with the ex-wife he cheated on. Wow, billionaires donating to billionaires brings a tear to your eye, doesn't it? Now, if all of this weren't enough for you, it becomes piercingly clear that the entire concept of billionaire charity is bullshit when you look at where it originated. In the Gilded Age of the late 19th century, the OG evil monopolist Andrew Carnegie wrote an essay called The Gospel of Wealth, in which he famously argued that it's the responsibility of the We're gonna wealthy move on to the to Herschel Walker debate in a second. During their lifetimes. He even argued that it's the duty of a rich man to set an example of modest, unostentatious living, shunning display or extravagance. So Chouinard and Walton weren't radicals by driving beat up old cars. They were literally taking their instructions from Daddy Carnegie. Now critically, Carnegie argued for that kind of charity because he believed that the system that gave him such unimaginable wealth was a good thing and that it was inevitable. It was just the way of the universe. But even at the time, in the late 19th century, Americans knew that this was bullshit. They knew that Carnegie's wealth was the result of a broken system. Especially then, because there was a viable leftist movement. And that it came at the expense of the customers he gouged, the workers he exploited, and the political system he dominated. A political system that ensured workers had no right to organize, no minimum wage, and allowed plutocrats to hire thugs to beat the shit out of them whenever they asked for their fair share. Carnegie's Gilded Age concealed a rot at the core of the economy. And in the years after his death, the country went through a little something called the Great Depression. Huh. Turns out letting so much wealth accumulate in so few hands wasn't a great idea. The New Deal that Franklin Delano Roosevelt launched in response was strongly influenced by progressive reformers who were alarmed at the excesses of Gilded Age plutocrats like Carnegie. Roosevelt introduced stronger labor protections, a minimum wage, strong antitrust enforcement so that monopolies couldn't form, and perhaps most importantly, a high level of taxation on the wealthy. And it worked. The labor movement flourished, which led directly to the creation of the American middle class. Average Americans, average white Americans anyway, were able to make a living wage, save for retirement, and build wealth of their own. Wealthy people still existed, and they were still able to make money, but the age of tight- It's just now starting, We will Please. begin with-